Good afternoon, church. How are you guys doing? It's sunny outside. You're going to hear it all day long. It's beautiful. It is 70 some odd degrees. And I decided, you know what? It would be a good day to wear all black with shoes that don't breathe. I don't know why, but here I am. Um, As Marty said, yes, um, I have taken over as the youth pastor, uh, which means two things. One, it means that I believe that the next great revival is going to come from the younger generation. It means that they have, they have giftings and calls upon their life, and they're not as stubborn and set in their ways as us adults are. And so I believe in them. What it, what also what it means, second thing, is that I'm just a little bit crazy and a little bit psychotic because you kind of have to be when you deal with teenagers on a weekly basis, and then you think to yourself, huh, I think I'll do that again. So um, (laughs) you have to be just a little bit crazy uh, to to do that. And so um, I have the privilege of sharing with you um, as a part of a series that we've been going through. If you don't know, we, we are going through a series called You Asked For It, which means that you asked for this sermon. Imagine that. Um, you may have remembered last week, you may have got, if you were here, you may have gotten water splashed on you uh, by, by Sir Craig Brown. Um, I don't know if he's been knighted, but I, he, I guess he's a sir now. Um, and uh, this week, I, I hope to, uh, uh, to, to share with you a little bit about the Word of God, actually a lot about the Word of God, and a little bit about myself, and maybe a little bit about you. But before we do that, I would love to tell you a story. Is that okay? Can I tell you a story? So... Um, I am a father of two children, married to a beautiful woman. Her name is Samantha Simmons. And uh, my son is about three and a half years old. And my daughter is about to be three months old. Very tiny, beautiful, amazing baby girl holding her melts my heart. Um, So my son is hilarious. He's also extremely energetic. um, And his attention is like, it's like, oh, hi, no, that, no, this, no, that. And it's very hard to keep him kind of like, just, would you just hold still? Um, but I love him very much. And, um, you know, being a father has taught me a lot. It's taught me a lot about God. It's taught me a lot about the Bible. It's taught me a lot about myself. It's taught me a lot about family. Um, and, you know, one thing that I have learned is that I am not a perfect parent. Are there any perfect parents in the room? Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> We will talk about you lying in church later. Um, So, I am not a perfect parent. Um, You know, the thing is about three-year-olds, I call my son my three-nager because he he is on the brink of independence, or so he thinks, and he thinks that he can do everything by himself. Um, And so, sometimes I have to go, hey, Bubba, we don't do that. We don't do that. Stop that. Please. Hey, stop. Please. No. Hey, stop. And by like the 30th time, I'm usually like a little bit frustrated. So there was a particular instance where I may have gotten, let my anger get the best of me. Um, Go figure. And I raised my voice, I would say, just a little bit too high at my son, which scared him. And he cried. And I felt terrible. Um, and so there's a thing that we do in my household where we, we apologize for our actions and then we ask for forgiveness. And so I get down on my son's level. I say, hey, bub, daddy let his anger get the best of him. And that was not the right thing for me to do. Can you forgive me? Now, normally my son goes, yeah, dada, I can forgive you. We hug it out. We go about our day. It's a good time. But this particular time, he looks at me and he goes, no, dada, I don't forgive you. And I'm like, ow, first of all. And I stopped and I stepped back for a second. I'm like, man, that's really unfortunate. I already feel bad. And now I feel like a terrible parent. Um, And I go, you know what? Okay, bud. Um, I'll let you, 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 I'll let you, you can take a breath, you can go, we can go about our day. You come back to me when, when you're ready to forgive me, and, and we'll just leave it there. I love you so much. 
He goes, okay, dad, and then runs off and plays with race cars and breaks a bunch of things and does whatever three-year-olds do for a little while. Totally forgets about the conversation that we had. Um, so, but I did not um, because I am, am seething inside in pain. Um, but <laughs> that night, I go to bed, kiss Judah on the head, rub his back. Love you, buddy. Love you, dad. Okay. I'm going to go to bed. Good night, dad. All right. Good night. Close the door. Do the walk of shame back to my bedroom. Uh, and I go to sleep, and it felt terrible to go to bed, not hearing that my son forgave me. So I go to sleep that night, and um, if you have kids, um, you know that they don't always sleep through the whole night. Um, and so about like 2 o'clock in the morning, I hear from down the hallway, Ear! which is the door opening, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and some little feet. <laughs> now, normally, this does happen every now and then, but usually what will happen is, Judah will wake up, he'll come out, he'll run around, he'll see that it is pitch black, and he'll go, oh, it's time to go back to bed. And then run back, and you hear, and then he just goes back to bed. Um, it wakes me up every time. I'm a very light sleeper. Um, but this time, I'm like, so I'm thinking, okay, he's just going to go back to sleep. So I just, I just kind of lay in bed. And um, he kind of, he started to walk. He wasn't running anymore, so I couldn't really hear his footsteps. And he, he wakes me up. Now, the way that my son uh, decides to wake me up is his little three-year-old hand comes over and just kind of, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> am I being robbed? <laughs> and he goes, Dad. I'm like, no, Bubba, no. No, 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 too, too late, too late. Go to bed, go to bed. No, Dad, Bubba, no. I need to tell you something. Okay, what's up, what's up? Dad. I forgive you. Two o'clock in the morning. I've never been more happy to be woken up at two o'clock in the morning. Wow, Bubba, thank you so much. Okay, Dad, can you take me night night? Yeah, let's go, come on. All right, get out of bed. Put him down to bed. It felt amazing to be forgiven. And so what I would love to talk to you about today is what it's like to live forgiven. Would you please stand for the reading of the word? I love this culture piece. I, I don't know. I think Seth introduced this culture piece into our house. And what it is is to, to, to distinguish between what is absolute truth and what I may or may not mess up at some point during the sermon. So, uh, but this, you at least can know, is absolute truth. Amen? It's the word of God. We're going to be reading out of the book of Matthew in chapter 18. Verses 23 through 35. So if you would go with me. Jesus is speaking here. It says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay his master, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave his debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him 
to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to you, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this time where we get to spend in your word, Lord, learning more about you, about your heart. God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would open up our hearts to receive from you, Lord. Allow us to not leave this place unchanged and continue to pour out your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that this would be completely from you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So, very interesting scripture. I would argue very, very convicting scripture. Um, and before we, we get too crazy into some things, I would love to give you some perspective. So in verse 24, it says, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Everybody say 10,000. 10, now, this is a large monetary measurement, equal to about 6,000 denarii, which was the Roman silver coin, as it was the largest currency at the time. See, a denarius was the standard silver Roman coin who was currently ruling over the area at the time. Now, one denarius was equal to about a day's worth of wages. So, if a denarius was worth about a day's worth of ages or wages, and the ungrateful servant could only earn one denarius in a day, he would need to work 6,000 days in order to earn one talent, just a single one. So if we follow that math, 10,000 talents would be equal to about 60 million denarii or 60 million days of work. Now, I don't know if you understand, not all of us really, I would actually say all of us, can't really live 60 million days. Would you agree? At least not on this earth. So let me put this in today's terms. The average hourly wage in America, across the board, according to ZipRecruiter, is $15 an hour. If you break that down and the average workday is about eight hours, then that equals about $120 per day. Now, of course, over 60 million days, that would then equate to $7.2 billion. Dollars, 7.2 billion with a B. That is a ridiculous amount of money. How many, could, how many of you think you could use 7.2 billion dollars? There's a couple of you, some of you are like, that responsibility actually scares me. I don't want to be rotten. And hey, listen, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I get it. I'm with you. The reality is, is that Jesus, this, you can actually see this throughout the Bible. Jesus likes to speak in hyperboles. Why? Because it catches your attention. And, and in my mind, I'm like, that's ridiculous. $7.2 billion. Well, of course it is. It is indeed ridiculous. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> it is ridiculous. See, this, in verse 26, as we continue, it says, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, the master, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now this says something about the master. He is either foolish or he is exorbitantly wealthy. To be able to go, yeah, that debt, 7.2 billion, you know what, today, we'll just wipe that out. You go about your day. You just go about your day. And imagine walking away from a moment, owing $7.2 billion, and all of a sudden, just not. That seems a little bit crazy, doesn't it? See, what Jesus is trying to show here is that it is an absolute ridiculous, and I would argue impossible amount to be paid. Would you agree? 
For one person, in order to pay back $7.2 billion, you either have to be Bill Gates, Donald Trump, or some other crazy rich person, or you have to work for 60 million days, <laughs> which is not feasible for us to do. See, the foundation of our faith is that Jesus came and died on a cross for our sins. Would you agree? Some of you. <laughs> we now walk in the empowerment of the forgiveness that Jesus paid for. Your debt was exorbitantly high and yet was wiped out when someone else paid for it. But as we go on in verse 28, it says, But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. So real quick, let's follow the same calculation that we did earlier. The amount said here, the, the denarii, equates to about $12,000 in today's terms. If we follow the same calculation, one day's wage, $15, $120 a day, all of that equates to about $12,000. Now, to put this even more into perspective, this is 0.0000016% of what the other servant had owed to his master. Now, I cannot even quantify what that is fractionally. However, what I do know is, is that that is exorbitantly minuscule compared to $7.2 billion. That is absolutely crazy. There is a massive debt. And though this servant was forgiven of much, so much that you, could, that you, couldn't, you can't even understand paying it, he goes out, and rather than, ex rather than extending the same mercy that was given to him, he holds on to unforgiveness. So today, I want to talk to you a little bit about what it looks like to live unforgiven. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Henry, I see where you're going, okay? We don't forgive and whatever and all this kind of stuff. I see what you're doing, okay? And, I, and, and, and you might be saying, well, well, you know what, Henry? You don't know what they, what they did to me, okay? You don't know what's been done to me. You don't know, you don't know what, what that person said to me. You don't know what's been stolen from me. You don't know what, 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 what has been taken from me or what, has, what, what somebody has done to my family or my friends. And there's all of these different things that may be running through your mind of like, well, I have all of these justifications and reasons to be angry and unforgiving. And I would tell you this. You may feel that you are justified in your anger. And, and honestly, you may actually be justified. Truly, there are horrendous things that are done to you. However, if you hold on to the anger and the unforgiveness, you will eventually turn to bitterness. Bitterness will eventually turn to a hardened heart. And a hardened heart cannot receive from God or the Holy Spirit. In verse 32, as we go on, it says, Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all, the debt, all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have forgiven and had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? I'm going to tell you a story. And it will make you uncomfortable. If there are, well, I'll just tell you this. It, it's PG-13. Um, when I was about seven or eight years old, 
I was sexually abused for about a year of my life. Now, that may be shocking to some of you. You didn't think that you were coming to church to hear that today. But this is what I'm here to tell you. My innocence was stolen from me. It was a boy who lived in our neighborhood at the time. We lived out in the sticks in Kid Island Bay, which um, now is million-dollar homes, but when I lived there, it was a trailer park. But it was a boy who was much older than I was, and we were friends. And I didn't know exactly how to process this at that age, which realistically your, your brain at that age probably can't physically process what's going on. But my view of intimacy was also broken. My idea of relationships was destroyed entirely. And I started to become addicted to many different things during this time. This boy would say things to me like, well, we're friends. This is what friends do. Don't tell your parents because they'll be mad at you. Well, this is, this is just what love is like. There were these lies and these things that continued to be told to me that, that enabled the continuous abuse over the course of a year. And as I grew up, I started to realize that it was wrong, indeed. What happened to me was actually evil. And I, I also realized that maybe, or thought, maybe I am at fault here. And I couldn't feel, I didn't feel like I could tell my parents because the lie stuck in my head, well, they'll be mad at you. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know why it was wrong or, or, or how it was wrong, but I knew that something was wrong in my heart. And I, and I knew, well, if, if, I, if I did something wrong and I tell my parents, then I'll be in trouble. And as I got older, to try and numb the pain because I wasn't allowing it, I wasn't, I wasn't dealing with it. I wasn't confessing it. I wasn't dealing with any of it. But the reality is, is that when pain is inside of you and somebody hurts you and there is a brokenness, it, it is required for you to deal with it. Forgiveness is God's way of dealing with it. And I wasn't ready for that. So I ran. I got addicted to drugs. I got addicted to pornography. I got addicted to alcohol. I got addicted to relationships. I got addicted to pretty much anything that you can be addicted to. I got addicted to video games. For those of you who think that's, that, that's not possible, it is. I got addicted to so many different things to try and numb and run away from the pain. But that wasn't all. I was bitter. I blamed my addictions. Well, it's that boy's fault. It's his fault that I'm broken. It's his fault that I'm hurting. It's his fault. If, if that never happened, then I wouldn't be this way. I wouldn't be addicted if he never did this to me. And there was an anger that, that, that resided inside me towards this boy. Well, it, it, if, if he was never a part of my life, maybe if he would just die, I would feel better. Maybe if I knew that he was hurting, maybe if I knew that he was broken, then maybe I would feel better. And then I blamed myself. Well, I just didn't know what love was, and I, I, I fell into it. I was stupid. I was an idiot. Maybe I gave him the wrong idea. I'm the reason why no one loves me. I was tormented. And I couldn't forgive God. After all, what loving God would allow that to happen? Horrendous acts. God, if you were all good, then how could you possibly let this happen? I was so young. How could this possibly be good? And I lived in a constant state of unforgiveness. In verse 34, it says, And his anger, and the anger of his master, he delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive 
your brother from your heart. Now, it was around the age of 17. I had been trapped in this cycle of unforgiveness. And what the word says here is that word delivered. It's actually the same word that's used in Romans 1 when it says God delivered them or gave them over to their sinful desires. What it means is is that he, he surrenders or he yields and delivers. Essentially, God is like, well, if that's what you would like, then okay, go ahead. It's look, it looks a lot like this. Well, maybe if I just handcuff myself, maybe, maybe he'll feel the pain. Maybe if I just handcuff myself, he'll recognize that I was hurting. Maybe if I just handcuff right here and I, I, I bind myself, I restrain myself from receiving intimacy, then, then, then he'll be in pain. He'll be hurting. Now, you might be thinking, well, Henry, that doesn't make sense. Well, of course it doesn't make sense. And yet, this is what we do. I was 17 years old when I came to know the Lord, bound and shackled. I came into a room much like this room here, and I I lifted my hands in worship for the first time. All of the bad things that I had done, all the people that I had hurt, I thought, there's no way God could forgive me. And I raised my hands in worship, and I felt the weight of God's glory come over me. And he freed me and he said, I forgive you. But my chains still rattled. But God, I'm forgiven. But God, I'm forgiven. You are. But have you forgiven? What do you mean, God? Have you forgiven? God, I can't forgive him. Do you not know what he did, God? I cannot forgive him, ever. I, will, I won't do it. I won't ever do it, God. I will never forgive him. And as I'm speaking and pleading to God, my chains are rattling. What does it look like to forgive? In Matthew 6, verse 12, It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's something that happens as we insist that it is together with another action. One does not happen without the other. God, forgive me as I forgive. See, we come into this church and we come to church all the time and we say, well, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. Meanwhile, we hold this bitterness in our heart. And what do these chains do? They restrain you. You can't do the call of God and the things that God wants you to do while you're shackled. It's impossible. I have a lovely and beautiful wife and I would love to give her a hug, but it'd be very hard to do with handcuffs on, wouldn't it? I'd love to hold my beautiful baby girl in my hands, but that would be very hard to do with handcuffs on, wouldn't it? I'd love to preach the rest of this sermon without being distracted about these chains hitting the microphone, but that's pretty hard to do with these shackles on. To do the work of God and to live in a life of intimacy that God has called you to while being chained and shackled is not just hard to do. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. Forgive us as we. Well, God, I I do forgive. I God, I can you just unlock the chains? God, I, I I forgive. Okay, I forgive him. I forgive him. I promise. I promise. I forgive. I God, come on, seriously. I I, I forgive. I, I I said it out loud. I said it out loud. I believe it. Okay, God, can we just can we? And then we. Why won't these chains come off? 
And I had to stop and go, okay, God, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to take off the handcuffs. I'll put the key down. And you know what? He did wrong me. It did hurt. But I also wronged you, didn't I? I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your forgiveness. And yet you gave it to me freely. See, you can say it all you want, but until you give up control, until you give up the shackles to God, you cannot be free. You can't unlock them yourself. God has to unlock them. But it's up to you to ask. You must confess with your mouth. Don't get me wrong, you have to. As a matter of fact, it's riddled throughout the Bible, confessing with your mouth. That, that, that it, it's not belief if you don't confess is essentially what it says. We confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in that moment, it becomes reality. So God, I do forgive him. I do forgive him. And even if you feel like you don't believe it, you continue to repeat it and you say, God, I do forgive, I do forgive, I do forgive. And what else does the Bible say? Well, in, in Matthew 5, verses 43 for 44, through 44, this is Jesus speaking. He says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that it does not excuse what they did to you, but it does stop them from continuing to hurt you. You've made, you may have heard this saying in church before, but living in, an, in unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You are hurting yourself. It's not about them. It's about you. You are hurting yourself. So we must love them. Well, I can't love them. They hurt me. I know. Trust me, I know. I know that they hurt you. I'm well aware. But the reality is, is the same love that was extended to you when you said, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. In all of your brokenness, in all of your sin, in all of your lies, in all of your hurting of other people, in everything that you've done, God said, okay, because I love you, because I love you, even though your debt is unpayable by anyone of your stature, I will send my son, my only son. And because I love you, he will take the lashings that you deserve. He will take the nails that you deserve. He will take the ridicule that you deserve. He will take the pain that you deserve. He will take the abandonment that you deserve. He will take what you deserve, and he will nail it to a cross. And when it is nailed, your debt is paid because I love you. Are we not enemies to God when we live in sin? Are we not? Breaking the covenant of marriage that God promised to us when we are sinning. And yet God forgives. And yet God forgives. What does it look like? Well, Jesus says, pray for them. So eventually, at, at a certain point, after I decided, okay, God, I'm ready to take the shackles off. God said, pray for him. Now, if I'm being honest with you, this is how my prayer started. Lord, I pray that you catch him. God, I pray that he's in pain right now. Just a little bit, please. Lord, I pray that, that, he's, that he's in prison and he knows, he knows what he did. I pray that he knows how he hurt me. I pray that, God, I pray that. And then God stops me. No, son. I need you to bless him. God, I don't know if I can do that. Well, maybe you can't in your own strength. 
So do it with me. Okay, God. Father, wherever that boy is, I pray that you would forgive him as I have forgiven him. Father, wherever he is, I pray that you would fill him with your love. I pray that you would embrace him because, Lord, you only know how broken he must have been to do something so bad. So, God, I pray that his brokenness would be healed in your name. And, God, I pray whatever, whatever curse has been set upon him, that it would be broken. Father, that you would forgive him of everything that he's done. God, love him, please. I pray that one day I meet him and I can tell him that I forgive him. Because in reality, he was broken just like me. And I love him through all the pain and the hurt and everything that he may have caused me. I love him. But it takes God. It takes Jesus. And maybe you're in this room today and you're thinking to yourself, well, Henry, this sounds great, but I don't even know Jesus. I don't even know God. I don't know this person that you're talking about. I don't know this, 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 this process that you're talking about. Sure, it sounds great, but me and God don't get along very well. Maybe you thought you were going to walk into this church and burst into flames today. I promise you I felt that way. <laughs> but the reality is, is that there is a God who is loving and compassionate and has been seeking you. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while and you're like, yeah, I'm saved. I come to church on the weekends, but then I live out my unforgiveness during the week. I'm here to give you an opportunity today. If you are walking in that place of unforgiveness and maybe you don't know God or maybe you ran from God and you are ready to come back to him, I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender the shackles, to give your life completely and wholly to Jesus, to let go and allow him to lead you. Because even when Jesus sat on a cross as, as he was beaten and bruised for you, as he was spat on and a crown of thorns was pressed into his forehead, and maybe you even heard this many times. As those things happened, he was nailed to a cross, and with his final breaths, as he was dying, he said, forgive them as it was happening, for they know not what they do. He already forgave you. It is your choice to walk in it. 